Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm Chelsea Klein, and I'm delighted to introduce Archer Mayer. <clears throat> Archer has not only written 23 best-selling book novels, he's also a death investigator for Vermont's Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, a detective for the Wyndham County Sheriff's Office, the publisher of 18 of his own books. He has 25 years experience as a volunteer firefighter and EMT, and he travels the Northeast giving speeches and conducting workshops, meaning he pretty much has three full-time jobs, and yet he loves what he does. <clears throat> Archer says that two things drive him, ignorance and curiosity. His insatiable curiosity compels him to ask and seek the answers to all sorts of questions. How much can one drop of blood tell you? <clears throat> and what can you learn from three different drops of blood? Can they be tied together? The questions that he asks and the answers that he discovers are spun into tales that are delightfully scary, the kind of books that keep you turning the pages and finding it very hard to fall asleep at night. What is particularly interesting about Archer and his work is that you may never know where he will find his inspiration and what will make its way into one of his elaborate tales. Did you know that ginkgo trees have a male and a female variety and that the females stink? It may take 20 years for you to know what you have, but when you do, it's pretty much too late. How do I know this? I read it in one of Archer's books. And of course, the smell of the ginkgo is an important clue. Did you know that in Vermont there is a racetrack that has been abandoned for 15 years but still has a full-time caretaker who works there? It's in one of his books. <clears throat> Give him the opportunity to answer the question, I wonder where that leads, and he'll find out. He's wandered through impossibly long, three-foot-high, pitch-dark storm tunnels, crawled out onto precarious catwalks 100 feet in the air, parachuted, rappelled down cliffs, and flown many hours in small aircraft, checking out anything that he might possibly use in a book. Will someone die there? Might the bad guy run away into the tunnel under the reservoir? Can a tracer bullet ignite gasoline? Can you suffocate someone so it can't be easily detected? He says, I may write fiction, but I do, write to, I do like to write about the real stuff. So I now introduce the man that has found a way to live a fascinating mosaic of a life that is both inspiring and more than a little creepy, Archer Mayer. <laughs> A little creepy. Oh, I guess I is what I is. I'm also not wedded to these devices, so they've rigged me with a wandering mic. Because uh, uh, I make for a poor target if I move around. So uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, as you uh, heard, I'm not big on uh, lectures. Uh, I, I, that doesn't mean I won't talk late into the night. That I can do. But uh, what I prefer to do is to find out why anyone on God's earth would come to see me do anything. Uh, so that's why I sort of turn the tables a little bit on, on the show, on the people th showing this, uh, this sh the putting a show on, because I want to, uh, I want to be of service or of use to people who might have questions about how I do, what I do, why I do it, and, and uh, stuff like that. So. Uh, Chelsea, of course, you know, ruined most of my introductory <laughs> comments by telling you most of that stuff. But uh, I, it is true that I started as a writer, good Lord, what was that? I don't know what the math is, but 1975, I, I pulled out my handy dandy typewriter. Uh, Dan and I were comparing technical notes uh, about uh, toys that we are now saddled with, you know, these bloody things. Mine is always unplugged, by the way, but uh, I started out with typewriters, and I started out um, because I was sort of underemployed. I actually had a job. It was the last full-time job I ever had, in fact. I uh, gave that up in 1975, and I haven't been paid since. But what occurred was that I was working in an academic environment, much like this one. Uh, it had a press, which uh, was like a publishing house. It was the University of Texas, in which one campus alone had 50,000 students, just to give you an idea of scale. So they had uh, what they obviously called the University of Texas Press, and I was the special projects editor, uh, which of course tells you nothing, which was the whole point. Uh, I was to be the editor in secret, because as they had discovered, publishing books about the sociological impact of left-handed chimpanzees in Peru in 1843 didn't turn out to be a bestseller. Go figure. Uh, so they hired me to see if I could generate manuscripts for the press that might make some money. 
Now you have to understand in the world of academia, especially back then, making money was a dirty thing. You weren't really supposed to talk too much about that because these were empires of the mind and lucre was a word you didn't really bring up much. So I was told to be discreet. Well, I blew it because I went out on campus, I found uh, a manuscript I thought would be wonderful and would certainly offset some of that red ink. Uh, and in fact, what it did was put us on the New York Times bestseller list for six months. That was a huge tactical error. Uh, and it resulted in my being restricted to quarters for the in rest of my career at the University of Texas Press. Um, so what is one to do if one is hired to do a job you've no longer been allowed to continue? Well, of course, you write stories of homicide. <laughs> and you feature the press director as the first victim. <laughs> At least that's what I did. <laughs> Now, this was an unpublishable book, which brings me to uh, the greater theme, which is writing in general. If you set out to type 300 pages, I think initially uh, that you should be content that you have typed 300 pages. I oftentimes get approached by people who say, golly gee, I've written my very first novel, uh, and I'd like to be able to do something with it. And my response is usually, truly, your very, very first, this is the first novel you've ever written? Said, oh, yes, sir. And I said, well, then I do have a recommendation. Burn it. Because what happened the first time you jumped on a bicycle? What happened the first time you borrowed your parents' car? The first time you fell in love? The first time you did anything, you probably messed it up. Well, trust me, you messed this one up, too, unless you're the only Mozart that we're likely to see in this generation. Chances are you did what everyone else does, which is you began. But you didn't hit an achievement of note your first time out. It just doesn't happen. The way to get published is the same way to get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. And you learn through your mistakes. So basically, I'm not actually telling them to burn the manuscript, but I am encouraging them to get used to the idea that this may not get published. And it may not even get a passing grade if it happened to be an academic exercise. The idea being, write it once, write it again, write it a third time, write it a fourth time, keep going at it. Sometimes you will discover that the book itself just doesn't work for you any longer. You don't enjoy the editing and the rewriting of this particular book. And that will tell you that it probably did what it needed to do for you. At that point, you do give it up and you walk away. I have a filing cabinet with eight to 10 full or partial manuscripts of the books that I began early in my career. Now, were they fundamental to my development? Oh yeah. Do they stink? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Each one stinks a little less than its predecessor, and they're in chronological order as they work towards the front of the filing cabinet. But why do I keep it nearby instead of just burning this stuff? Is because I want to remind myself when I'm feeling good and cocky, which is perfectly likely for someone who's written over you know, 25 books, of the humbleness of my roots. We all come from there. Okay, so don't take umbrage at the fact that you didn't succeed the first time out. But we do, and it's too bad. So I think we should lighten up on yourself and lighten up on your expectations. Work like the devil to get this stuff out the first time, but don't worry about it if it's not a home run. We, especially as Americans, are brought up on the notion that every shot should be a home run. Nonsense. You know, learn to work in the vineyards a little and learn to benefit from the hard work of just for the sake of the work itself. Now, what brought me into that direction? I have no idea. Now you can see why I'm so dependent on questions, because otherwise I just ramble on for hours on end. I uh, came to Vermont after I stopped being underemployed uh, by presses and other places 
down in Texas. I went to Vermont because uh, I was unemployed and I was penniless. And that turns out to be a great place to go to because you're surrounded by like people. <laughs> Uh, I have three jobs, as uh, Chelsea just told you, uh, and I uh, would l be s stared at askance in Vermont if I had fewer than three jobs. Everybody has multiple jobs in Vermont. That's just called employment up there. And, and whenever we go into economic, national economic downturns, everyone in Vermont just kind of goes, what? Yeah. We're in a permanent economic downturn there. We just sort of gotten used to it and embraced it almost because we're kind of cranky. So it was a natural place for me to go. Um, and I began to write first history books uh, just to sort of get into the swing of things. Uh, these uh, got published, uh, which therefore got me away from the contents of that drawer. Um, and at the same time that the history books appeared, so did jo the Joe Gunther novels appear. It was sort of a, a nice uh, confluence of factors. So in 1988, I was able to swing away from writing history books and swing into writing full-time mysteries, which I've turned out about once a year. I don't turn out a murder mystery a year because I'm prolific. I turn it out because I'm broke. Uh, the average income of an American writer is about 8,000 bucks. I do better than that, but being uh, a, a regular machine in terms of cranking this stuff out helps. Uh, also having the other two jobs helps. I do make a living as a writer though, uh, and this is uh, to be stressed because only about 5% of all the writers you'll ever meet can make that claim. So that puts me as a snappy dresser as I am, in the same company as Stephen King. So you can see that that five percentile has got an absurd learning curve to it. I mean, just, just gigantic disparity, uh, disparagement in, in, uh, in income. But the other 95%, those are all the people who have day jobs, uh, who married well, uh, who work in academic environments and might have more time during the summer to, uh, to write murder mysteries or novels or whatever they're writing, uh, or they uh, rob banks, which is always uh, not something I'd recommend, but it's, you know, it's a possibility. So long story short, it wasn't too terribly long before both curiosity, maybe a little bit of ambition, and opportunity presented themselves to me uh, to become, first of all, a death investigator for the medical examiner's office. This was because the system was being changed around in Vermont. Now, I understand that a few of you here uh, are either knowledgeable of these lines of business that I have, both law enforcement and forensics, uh, or you are students of this. So I'm going to get a little nerdy and describe to you a little bit about how the medical examiner system works in the state of Vermont, because it's a little bit offbeat. Uh, and it plays to its advantage, funnily enough. In terms of, of ratios, Vermont probably has the highest level trained death investigators in the United States. Uh, and our uh, medical examiner's office is probably one of the best in the United States. Now, part of this is number crunching. There are only 12 people in the state of Vermont. <laughs> so if you have five that are really good, well, hey, you're almost halfway home. Uh, but it also uh, goes to that it's a very centralized system. So we've got one medical examiner, one assistant or deputy medical examiner, and all the rest uh, are sort of paid volunteers like myself. Believe it or not, as a death investigator, I get paid piecework, <laughs> and each piece is dead. You know. So I have good weeks and bad weeks. You know. uh, I had a very bad week, which is good for all of you, but lousy for me just two weeks ago. And that just means I stand around waiting for the pager to go off for seven days in a row, which is when I'm on shift 24-7. Uh, and I wait for something to buzz, beep, or startle me awake in the middle of the night. And if it doesn't happen, well, then everything in my county and a half of coverage has been just terrific. Uh, and if it goes off sometimes four times a night, 
well, then the Grim Reaper has been working overtime. Uh, and that's sort of how it works. Now, at one point or another, that one medical examiner decided that we should really polish our practice to the highest degree possible. And he sent us all off to be nationally certified. So all of us, uh, or a huge number of us, are board certified death investigators, which means we could work anywhere in the United States, even though we are confined to Vermont at the moment. Uh, and this is, pushed up the level of game that we play as investigators to an absurd degree. Uh, and in fact, when we go just across the border into Massachusetts, you can see that the number of equally trained death investigators in the state of Massachusetts is way below what our level is. Uh, so this has been an education for me to, to, to discover just how good my little podunk state can be. Uh, about several years after I signed on with the uh, medical examiner's office, I was having lunch with a cop. Uh, it was a friend of mine who was also a co-investigator. Uh, and he said, uh, since he was a sergeant uh, at the Bellows Falls uh, Police Department at the time, he's now um, a member of uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. I think that's an outfit. They started with the acronym and the really cool jackets. And then they invented, you know, what does ICE stand for? So they came up with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is a real tongue twister, but ICE, now that's cool. So their badges say ICE, and their clothes say ICE, and they say ICE, and it's real nonsense. But anyhow, so he plays with the big boys now. But he was a humble sergeant for the Bells Falls Police Department at the time, and we were having lunch together. And he said, well, it occurs to me that now that you've spent so many years writing and researching these crime novels, the Joe Gunther crime novels, and indeed I'd written about 14 or 15 of these by the time this conversation occurred. He said, you know, chances are you may know more about Vermont law enforcement than any cop. And in fact, he wasn't just spouting hyperbole because I wander across the state and I find out indeed how law enforcement functions in every department across the state, of which there are 68. And as a result, uh, when, uh, after he conquered my challenge to him when he offered me a job by saying, do you know how old I am? And he said, that's precisly why we want you, which I thought was sort of a geriatric foul game because it totally appealed to my vanity. But, I, I signed on and joined up what I later found out to have been nicknamed by the head statistician in the state of Vermont to be Dodge City. Because Bellows Falls on a per capita basis has the worst crime record of any community in the state. And that's where I just hired on to be a cop. So for several years I chased taillights there and did domestic uh, violence complaints and all the rest of it because cops in Bellows Falls are non-specialists. In other words, as soon as they give you your gun and your keys to the cruiser, you're expected to do everything. So it's a great training ground and it allowed me to very shortly thereafter segue into uh, a special sex crimes unit where I investigated child sexual assaults for several years. That was a state uh, paid job, so I was plain clothes and I was finally able to get out of that, uh, that blue suit. Uh, and now I work for, uh, uh, I do major crimes investigations for the state's attorney's office uh, in Brattleboro. So those are the big ones like murders and, and uh, you know, uh, aggravated rapes and whatnot. So it's really interesting work for someone like me who was put on earth to do research and loves to poke my nose in other people's business. And then instead of going home uh, and drinking, you know, quarts of scotch, or kicking the dog that I no longer have, um, I write murder mysteries. So I can get all this violence and all this uh, disgusting exposure to human uh, misbehavior uh, out of my system by writing books. So it's a perfectly balanced universe as I've, uh, as I've come to see it. Uh, now admittedly, uh, yeah, I'm either talking about uh, or spending time with violated people, dead people, or crime books, so obviously my universe tends towards the dark side, but that's just me. You know. 
Having said all of that and having exposed a little bit about myself to all of you, we will now slide away from the advertised 15 minutes, which was probably about half an hour ago, and open to questions. So if anybody has any question at all about anything, now's your opportunity and we will engage in a conversation. By the way, I love to dominate a conversation, so usually you'll only get about two questions in and we'll be four hours into this event. Because I was told we, we ended at 10, right? <laughs> so who's got a question? Oh, well, she just left, so that's, that's fair. <laughs> All right, so you said that our first novel is usually bad. I'm an aspiring author, so that's something big for me. Um, what would you say if I wanted to go back to a first project again in a few years and see if I could just revamp it as opposed to put it in a drawer to collect dust? No, I think it's a great idea. This is what I was touching on a little earlier in that. I think you should take projects and work them and work them and work them, but there's going to be a time where you will either sense that you've got it as far as you can get it, or you'll be so sick of it you don't want to see it ever again. Either discovery is entirely good and highly pertinent because you will have done one of two things at the inception which was that you muckled on to a really bad idea, but you used it as a good training platform to practice your language usage and your storytelling and all the rest of it. But then you got good enough in your technique that you finally realized that the entire horse that you're riding on is dog meat, okay? So at that point, you walk away. And now you have the experience to take on a far better project. Or you begin to discover that the genesis that you began with, with which you had so much trouble, has now turned into something that really does have merit. And, and thus you can carry it forward. So I have, I have no reservations whatsoever that you use this as an exercised ground. Um, but, but just don't be don't deny yourself the realization that, that maybe it's not worth your while after a, after a while. Uh, and don't be shy to move on. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I and, and, and you will discover your own tricks. The funny thing, I go on panels with writers uh, and, and there'll be five of us all bored out of our minds because we all do exactly the same things in the same ways. This is not as a friend of mine once rather twistedly put it, rocket surgery, okay? You know, it's not that hard. You, you just, you have to be dedicated. You have to be bloodthirsty to yourself. Uh, you have to be hyper self-critical. You cannot in fact be thin-skinned and, and artsy-wartsy about the stuff. You gotta be practical. You gotta own up to your, mis your mistakes. And oftentimes, therefore, initially, and, and I even all these years later, because now I've been doing this full time for 32 years, and I still find the opinion of outsiders to be of value. My technique, for example, all these books later, is still to take the manuscript before I send it to my publisher and to make multiple copies and send them out to about five to eight trusted allies and they will give me some feedback because you should never forget one of the primary rules of the writer. And that is that the writer has no idea what it's like to read her own stuff. Okay, we can edit it, we can try like crazy, we can rewrite it, we can do all that stuff and that's good, that should be done. But the virginity of the reader that first time exposure to someone's writing is something the writer of that piece will never have. You will never have that freshness. You will never have that uneducated openness to someone else's clear voice because you're filled with memory. You know well, how you wanted this to turn out, but you had to compromise that away. You know what parts you put in and then you had to edit them out you know what parts you had to plug in because at the last minute you couldn't survive without those plugged in parts. 
All this mechanical stuff is stuff that's still alive and well in your head. The only way that you can get away from that is either put it on a shelf for 10 years and then flush all your memories free and then edit it, which I strongly don't recommend, or you find an editor. And you find editors whose opinion you trust. So don't do this to someone you're sleeping with and don't do it to someone you're related to, okay? <laughs> Or both, as in Vermont. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, it's, it's important that these people are free to speak their minds. Now, in my case, my mother would be fine. <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, she's 93, and she's no longer reading my stuff. But Margot, who's my best pal in the whole wide world over there behind the camera, she is one of my editors because she knows that I will not beat her up for speaking her mind if she says that one or another part of my book is crummy. But that's an exception. And normally I would never use someone near and dear in that capacity. So you gotta find these people. In this environment, of course, oftentimes those are your teachers. Also understand that any feedback that you get from anyone is not the law. And that's awkward in this environment because they do grade you if this is a gradable type product. So editorial opinions are just that. They are opinions. And the, anyone who says, well, I'm sorry, but this is unacceptable, and if you don't take my changes, well, then you're dead meat. That's, that's not a good place to put a writer, and you shouldn't have been put in that position. I mean, we all put our pants on the same way, and just because you're a teacher or an editor or a writer or a student or whatnot doesn't mean you glow in the dark with perfection. You know, we have our good days and our bad days, and sometimes the best way is not to get your feelings hurt and not to get bent out of shape, but take a deep breath, process the information, and then maybe go back and say, can we talk about this? And sometimes that can be almost as educational as the writing process was itself. Uh, because a lot of this is how you work your way through to the tail end of a story. Uh, and Margo and I do that to great constructive effect, whereby I write without an outline or a plot. Now, I didn't start that way, and I don't recommend doing that from the get-go. After you get to be an old horse like me, fine. But early on, do the homework, do the plot, do the outline, do all that stuff so that you know that you have a beginning, middle, and end. But don't be shy about walking away from some of those strict blueprints, okay? Don't tie yourself to the mechanical object, which is the outline. Because as you begin to write, that creative impulse, those characters, that that lively relationship that you have with any piece of writing should be allowed a certain spontaneity. And if you rigidly adhere to an outline that was conjured up in a production mode, then you're going to squash your creative mode and you shouldn't do that. I research over much whenever I do a book so that when I begin to build the book, in my actual writing, in the middle of it all, if the characters go to slightly to the right or they go slightly to the left, I've done enough research that I can support those characters with some research. On the book I just finished called Paradise City, it takes place in Northampton. I went down to Northampton and I found out things like a periscope factory. Super groovy, really nifty, had wonderful ideas about how I could put that periscope factory in the book. Did I do it? No, because the characters ended up going over there away from the, from the factory, so I didn't employ it at all. Did I fuss about that? No, because I over always over-research, so I didn't worry about it. Okay. I have no idea what your question was, but that's <laughs> the answer. <laughs> Who else? Yes. So how do you get the ideas for your, your plots, your, your you're not your books because I mean are there sometimes is it all imagination or is it some of sometimes things that have actually occurred that you put together in a very unlikely way it it does go without saying that I have exposed myself to a lot of stuff as a death investigator for example I have 
so far done in excess of 500 deaths of investigations. So that's a lot of dead people to take notes from. <laughs> no. And all they do is give and give and give. You know, these are very <laughs> generous people and quiet, you know, so they don't get in my way. Well, there have been a few that weren't so quiet, and then I realized they called the wrong guy, but <laughs> that's different. Anyhow, so the, the point is that, yes, I see a lot of this, but would it be ethical to, in fact, take those situations and transport them into a novel? Of course not. Right. But is there stuff, is there emotive, creative, atmospheric information available at each and every one of these scenes? Of course there are. And you, you, you make a mosaic of these personalities, of these situations, of these settings, of these intuitions. And in the process of working out the emotional turmoil that you come home with every night after steady exposure to this kind of diet, this is inordinately helpful to, to take these realities and to use them to what hopes, one hopes is a positive end result. But that end result has to come from somewhere. That's where the creativity and imagination kick in. Okay. Now, so what do you write about? Do you just write about your casework and you change a few names and a few, no. What you want to do is go for larger global issues. The human condition. Why do people do what they do? I write, I guess you could call them crime novels. Why do you call them crime novels? Because there are good guys, bad guys, dead guys, and car chases. Do I read crime novels? No. Do I like crime novels? No. Do I find most of them horribly written? Yes. So what the hell am I doing? I'm writing social anthropologies. I'm writing about conflict resolution. I'm writing about things you can't sell. But you call them crime novels, and everyone buys them. Well, you hope. <laughs> you know, not everybody. But enough to keep me alive on one side as a writer, where the average is income is what I mentioned it to be. So I got to do better than that. But by the same token, I also want to have my cake and eat it too. I want to write about the issues that are interesting to me. And the issues that are interesting to me are not, oh, said Elkie Poirot, I know you are the murderer because one of your shoes is not properly tied and only the murderer would have that because of this, that, that, and the other reason. I mean, I look at these Agatha Christie novels and I go, wow, I can't figure that stuff out. But I also go, golly gee, I don't care one whit for any of the characters in her books because she didn't much care about them. To her, the puzzle was all. To me, it's not. So with your characters, um, do you, I've heard from some authors, they say that they, when they create them, they become their friend. When people talk about them, they're always like, how do you know that? Yeah. Or are you one of those people who just creates a character, not Joe Gunther, but other characters in the novels that you just let go and run on their own? And then you like to hear what people think later. My characters are closer to me than my own family members, to be honest. Uh, certainly the major characters, you refer to Joe Gunther, but there are probably about five that I carry from book to book to book to book. These guys, I, I feel like at the beginning of every year, and I do begin the year with a new novel every year, I, it's like sitting down at a family meeting with the family you really like, <laughs> which I know can be a strong distinction. And I'm comfortable, I know them, I feel they know me, and as weird as it sounds, I am in fact in the presence of three-dimensional human beings. Now, are they based on anyone real? No, um, but I have spent so many years with these people that they are close friends and conduits to 
acquiring the information that I'm most interested in in book after book after book. Um, they, therefore, can be trusted by me without an outline to drive down the road of the novel with sure-footedness. And that's the other reason that I don't want to mechanize this process by laying too rigid a set of rules for them. Um, now, is that just because we spent so much time together that things segued that way? I, I would think so. I think if I were to reach back to 1988, when the first of these now 23 books came into being, it was a far more mechanical process for me. Now, I am stimulated, as Chelsea quite ably said, by ignorance and curiosity. I write about what I don't know. I write about what interests me. Uh, Paradise City was written because I didn't know Northampton very well, and it gave me an opportunity to examine it as a sociological pot of human beings. It also gave me the opportunity to examine the whole world of art pieces, these little bric-a-brac, these earrings and necklaces like yours, you know, the stuff that we end up with and well, Lord knows where they came from. Well, somebody made them. And where, where is that world and how does it function and, and where did the materials that made that necklace come from? And was it in fact above board? Maybe it wasn't. I was informed by a, a fellow police officer uh, that, oh yeah, a long time ago we pulled over a van and when we popped open the van, pulled him over on an oral traffic violation, popped open the back, and what was in the middle of the back of the van? A smelter. Because these guys were breaking and entering into people's homes, stealing collectible jewelry, and melting it down in the van. So they would steal, melt during transportation, and arrive at a jewelry store with maybe a somewhat less than austere uh, regulation about buying and selling stuff, and they would be delivered ingots of melted down precious metals. And the store would say, okay, fine, whatever, Pay, paid bottom dollar for the stolen stuff, and they didn't want to know what it was, and you couldn't prove it was stolen because it was melted down. Well, for an imagination like mine, that's all I need. And we go from there. So that's how all these books get constructed. The interesting part for me especially, is that as I go down through the telling of the story, and I have to tell it to myself first before you get to see it, obviously, I make certain discoveries, such as, whoops, I got the wrong bad guy. That's absolutely happened. Not once, but multiple times. I come to the end of the book, and I take a look at it, and I go, well, you know, the person that I ended up accusing of the crime just ain't interesting enough. It just doesn't hold well enough together. So you can either go back to the beginning of the book and maybe reconstruct that human being to become more interesting, or you can just dump her or him and make a new one out of the already pre-existing cast of characters because there is murder in all our hearts. <laughs> and it's not a huge stretch to take what used to be an innocent victim and make her or him into uh, the arch-villain. Because arch-villains is not what I write about. I just write about regular villains. In other words, us. Because that's the other thing that I've done over this vast extent uh, of time, is that I have created a body of work that merely discusses us. Okay, the bad guys are not truly bad guys. The good guys are not truly good guys. We're all sort of regular guys on this side or that side of an ethical line. And sometimes we wobble and sometimes we just chuck it out and head off in the far loony binned extreme of bad or good. Joe is kind of too good to believe. And some of my truly awful people that I rarely write about, but sometimes do in these books, well, they're way far out on the other side. But most of everybody else is clustered towards the middle. And I've always contended that as a cop, if only the, most of the people that I arrest 
if they only got my memo, which is that upon getting their driver's license, they should also be issued a bumper sticker, which by law should be affixed to their bumper. Then it would allow me to arrest them before they even commit the crime that they're inevitably going to commit because the bumper sticker reads, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> You know, these, these, I deal with impulse-driven folks. I can't believe you did that to me. Bam. Whoops. Guess what? You're now prone to being put in handcuffs. And, you know, I mean, we look good because you got great solve rates. We only look good because the people who do these nasty things, most of the time, they're not arch criminals. They don't appear in crime novels. In fact, they haven't even left the scene of the crime. They're still standing there going, oh, I just, you know, she pissed me off, so I duped her, you know? <laughs> and there it is, you know? We walk in, we look so good, you know, I, I slammed down another case. Well, yeah, you didn't even leave the room, for God's sake. Again, we go back to rocket surgery. You know, this is, but it's worthwhile, it's gotta be done. People have to be held somewhat to the straight and narrow. But that's how I look at my cop job, too. I don't go show up on duty with these tight little leather gloves and I go on, okay, vigilante stuff, we're going to you know, clean the streets. No, 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 no. Just try to be protect and to serve. You know, take care of the worst of the worst. Try to keep a little bit of a lid on society. Try to be of help. I, I remember being mentored by a guy way back when who said that every traffic stop is the passes that gives you the opportunity for a public relations encounter. It's true. So when you pull over that speeder or you pull over that weaving car or whatnot, you should not approach that vehicle along the lines of, okay, dirtbag, get out of the car. Instead, you start courteously. You ask them, what's going on? What's, you know, what's going on in your life? And the amazing thing is, is not only will you meet cooperation with cooperation, but you actually might get a hell of a lot bigger case than you would have otherwise. So instead of just getting someone who's driving erratically and you hand out a small ticket, you might, because of your approach, generate a whole story about, well, I, I happen to know what Dwayne's doing down at the end of the block, and since you've been so nice to me, I'll throw him under the bus and you won't give me a ticket and Dwayne will go away for 20 years. Yeah. You know, I never even got close to Dwayne to begin with, but I ended up with him at the end, and why? Because you're the nice guy. I had no problem having that reputation in Bellows Falls. Oh, well, he's the nice cop. Sure, all the way to jail. So, you know, it works out all right, but it, personality has a lot to say with it. And that goes back to these individuals, these characters that inhabit my books are exactly the same way. They work their way through this human tangle, which is us. So you won't see Bruce Willis buying the movie rights to my books anytime soon, because I don't write about him. Who else? Yes, I please. I sort of have two questions. The yeah. first one is just sheer curiosity about the book that sort of locked you in your office in Texas, where they put you, <laughs> what that book was that hit the bestseller list. But um, could you describe the training death investigators undergo and how yes. much of it is forensics and, and factual? And then is there some element of intuition involved in being a good death investigator, aside from the cases Abs where the absolutely. guy is standing there? Oh, sure. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. No, the intuition and the, and the brainstorming that occurs is crucial to what we do and how we do it. There's a reason that most investigators generally are going to have this colored hair is because it pays off to have gone through the trenches and to learn a little bit about human nature. Uh, and also uh, the whole idea of giving and taking, the whole idea of no, 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 calm down, slow down, take your time, think about it, think it through, sleep on it. No big rush in most cases, okay? What's done is done. Now, as a death investigator, you can be either law enforcement, which is a different route than, than uh, the medical examiner's office. Now, I, I do both. Uh, law enforcement, there are lots of rules and regs and whatnot, access to computers, uh, a lot of training along those lines, especially computers, because lots and lots and lots of time and effort and, 
energy is spent on information gathering. And it's true that cops have access to more information than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> it's really actually kind of creepy. I enjoy myself sometimes just sitting in my office, reaching into people's private lives, not to pry and poke around. They always have to be part of a criminal case. But when I've got that criminal case and I've got that number punched and I'm online legally, if you will, it's astonishing the kind of stuff that I can pull out of, of uh, let's call it Google on hormones. Okay, now obviously law enforcement is going to have access to that where you can't. Here's a perfect case in point. Most of the people in this room have a cell phone. All right, the cell phone has a lot of information beyond what you think it has. All right, and that information is held by your carrier, whoever that may be, Ma Bell in the old days. Okay, now there are timestamps. There are GPS stamps, there are amazing amounts of information, some of which you have no idea about. I, if it's a part of a criminal investigation, I can get that, just like that. You, as the owner of the phone, as the payer of the bill, if you contacted your carrier, they would not let you have that information. Because that's the disconnect. So there is this huge ability available to death investigators on the criminal investigation side. On the medical examiner side, it's all about, curiously, medicine. It has to do with what made you dead. Now, if it's a knife between your shoulder blades, then we work far more closely with the law enforcement side of the investigation because there are always going to be two halves. In fact, there are going to be three halves in every such investigation. There's going to be the prosecution, which is represented sort of by proxy. There's going to be law enforcement, which is at the scene, and the medical examiner's office, which is also at the scene. The reason for those last two is because a lot of cops don't know anything about medicine. So they look at a pill bottle and they just kind of go, oh, oh, what's this for? I don't know. It's white. Could be a drug, might be a medicine, could be a prescription, might be an over-the-counter thing. Who knows? They don't. I'm supposed to. So I walk around with a little computerized database in my pocket. I can take these numbers down, immediately run them through, find out why you take these pills. I can also find out if it's appropriate given because I call up the, your physician, you, you now being the dead person. <laughs> so I call up your physician and I say, well, give me a full medical breakdown. What was this person's problems? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Next thing you know, hey, this isn't the medicine for you. I know that stuff. The cop won't. That's why we work together in harness. Also, I have access, so I can burn right through HIPAA. Cops can't. Even though you're dead, that's uh, a, a privacy issue. But it's black letter law that a, that a uh, medical examiner can go right through that firewall doesn't exist for us. So if we work again in tandem, you know, the cop just turns to the medical examiner and says, help me out here. Not a problem. We can do that. So you can see where these two seemingly parallel and possibly overlapping arms actually have separate and clearly defined uh, missions that are mutually uh, helpful. Well, there, there is schooling that you go to, the cops go to police academies. Uh, the medical examiners, uh, in effect, are hired beforehand because of their pre-existing medical expertise. I have 25 years of EMS. So because of thousands of rescue calls and hundreds of administered IVs that I've given to patients out in the field, I have a comfort with medicine that your sort of walking day-to-day -day people aren't going to have. Uh, also, I'm used to responding to pagers. I'm also used to functioning calmly in a crisis situation because that's just what we do. So there are also character molding aspects to this kind of preschool, if you will, that are very attractive to the medical examiner at the top of the food chain. So he's going to be, or she's going to be, watching for these kind of people because they are already in their DNA 
investigators, okay? And they're also sort of crisis managers just by instinct because that's what they do. They're used to working in the middle of the night, in the middle of a rainstorm, in the middle of a car crash or a plane crash, and just sorting out the mess. Okay, so he then pulls, or she, in my case it's a he, uh, has been a she, uh, pulls these kinds of guys up and they say, look, um, we are now going to give you specialized intensive training. That will then fall to the medicines to the physical aspects of how a dead body presents itself, to how you should analyze a corpse from top to toe, what you should look for, what are the norms, what are not the norms, what are the expectations, what do you look for, and when you found something, how do you interpret it? That comes obviously through training and just as obviously comes through experience. So you process body after body after body. And after your first hundred bodies, you get pretty good at it, okay? Well, you go all over the United States. Uh, the higher level training University of St. Louis, uh, curiously in St. Louis, go figure. Uh, New York City uh, uh, Office of Chief Medical Examiner also is now getting into the education field. So I've done a week or so down there. Uh, and you take more and more intensive training. Some, there's a lot of continuing ed that you can do virtually. Uh, and then uh, if you join or become a member of the board, uh, the American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigators, MBDI, uh, then they will also send a lot of information your way through listservs and whatnot. Uh, so the training is vast and varied. Uh, but you've got to pursue it. So you don't, except for the basic schooling that I mentioned at those organizations, uh, I also, every, every summer I go to Colby College. They have a week-long seminar in forensic sciences, which might as well be forensic medicine. Uh, I go there. Uh, so you pursue this stuff, and if the boss is good and supportive, they pay for it, uh, or at least they take care of some of your expenses. Uh, my boss, for example, I go to Colby College on my own dime just because I find this stuff interesting and it's good for my end product. Uh, so there's a fair amount of self-starting that needs to be um, acknowledged and embraced. You don't just punch in and punch out, uh, at least not in Vermont. In other outfits, everybody pays for everything. You're just you know, a civil servant. Uh, but that's sort of the genesis of your training is it's far more disparate and disorganized than it might be if you were going to get a PhD in English, for example. A PhD in death investigation, that takes more muckle. You gotta go out there and really dig and figure it out. Uh, but there are communities to help you do this. It is, as they say up north, wicked interesting. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. I don't know how modern he is, but I'm reading the biography of Charles de Gaulle right now. He used to be ex-president of France. Uh, I'm a nerd, so I, <laughs> I, I read stuff like that. I read Cormac McCarthy. Uh, I read, you know, uh, The Road, um, No Country for Old Men. He wrote that, all uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, pretty uh, sort of dense stuff. Uh, I, I don't know why, maybe because it's far away from my own world as possible. The other thing is that these guys tend to be really good writers. And that means more to me sometimes than the content of their writing. Uh, if I can discover a good writing voice, and I did so just recently by reading the novel Swamplandia. And uh, that was, uh, came to me because it was one of the 10 best books uh, of uh, a couple of years ago by the New York Times. And any time that the New York Times book review is going to say, this is one of 10 books only of the thousands that were published. And I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to take a second look at that just to see. And indeed, this young woman has a writer's voice, the likes of which I've rarely encountered. Purely magical. Just a, a, a wonderful way of pushing out the boundaries of the English language. 
and making it dynamic and, and, and compelling to read. I see language as music. Margot's heard this 40 times, right? Bored to tears, but it's true. I can't get away from it. I was brought up overseas. I was brought up on the road. My father moved around a lot. I'm the bottom of six. I had no say in the matter. So I learned foreign languages. I went to foreign places. I never got English grammar. And in fact, for a while, I didn't speak English very well at all. So when I came back to the United States, my exposure to English was non-grammatical. It was only through books and through learned conversation. And I was lucky by the environments I ended up in that I benefited from both. Uh, but as a result, when I write, I write almost by ear. I wouldn't know a dangling participle if it bit me in the butt which may be a dangling participle for all I know. But I do know the sound of language, and I do know the tempo of it. And that is what I try to visit upon you when I write these books. And it certainly is what I respond to as a reader. Now here's something that, again, poor Margot hears this all the time because she's always stuck with me. But you guys, I think, should hear the following. And that is that storytellers shouldn't really be called that. More appropriately, if they're good at what they do, they should be story sharers. Writers don't write to people. Writers write with people. When I write a book for you, I am writing the book for people with creative, dynamic, intelligent imaginations. Who in this room has never been in the position of reading a book where you lost track of the fact that you were turning pages? Where you stopped paying attention that you were reading separate words on a white page? Where in fact you felt as if there was a movie projector that ignited in your head and began to take you forward and you might as well have not had a book in your hand at all? We've all been there. But we've only all been there at the hands of good storytellers. Okay? Why? Because those people knew instinctively or intellectually to get out of your way. In other words, I will try to set up a scene. I will set up a structure. I will give you characters. But not too much. What I'm trying to do is to give you a comfort zone so that your creativity can fill in the blanks and go forward. So if I lay out a campfire with a burning fire, you can hear it, you can smell it, you can see it with no prompting from me. The writers I do not like are the writers that say, well, there he was in his barn boots and his dirty blue jeans and his fancy blue jacket that he got for a bucket, you know, some discount place and the you know green sweater and detail by detail by detail what is that doing a description like that in a book merely robs you of the ability of the ability of supplying your own imagination with this character what is joe gunther my main character who who knows what i do for a living how many people have read one of my books all right maybe half of you you guys know what Joe Gunther, the primary character, looks like, right? Was it because I described him in great detail? I've never done it. Tall, short, fat, you know, he's a middle guy. He's middle this, middle that, average this, average that. He is what you want him to be. I've had people come to me and say, oh, I, I see him like I see you. Well, I don't see him like I see me. That's not Joe Gunther, that's me. But if that's who you see as Joe Gunther, that's your Joe Gunther. That's what I'm saying. You guys are storytellers. So when you get to being writers yourself, realize that all the work you're putting into this, a lot of it is already being done for you by the reader. So don't jam them up. Who else? There is, you had a question. Yeah, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Yeah. I never done it again. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, yeah, that's true. I should, we should eliminate that in the, in the reprint of Open Season. <laughs> Yes. Interviews. I mostly do interviews. Yeah. Sure. That's the primary research is interviews. No, it was always easy. Yeah, it's a personality thing. People are oftentimes inhibited with the idea that I need to talk to you and ask you everything. I go, oh gosh, she doesn't know me, and oh golly gee, you know, who the hell am I kind of thing. People love to talk about themselves. And if you approach them in a way that honors that impulse uh, and maybe flatters them a little bit, but it's not two-faced, uh, they'll open up. They just need to believe in you and trust in you to be frank with you. Uh, and you need to show common courtesies and allow them that. And don't interrupt them. This isn't about you. This is about, you know, the person you're interviewing. And so I found from the very, very beginning that this was incredibly easy to do. And people, you could put down a tape recorder, which I strongly recommend one does. Don't just have these conversations a la Truman Capote and hope that your memory will serve. It won't. Put down a tape recorder. Nobody cares. They're perfectly relaxed with recording machines. So embrace. Now, I also do some quirky stuff. I generally try to get into an airplane, oftentimes piloted by a licensed pilot. And, and we go up over whatever physicality I'll be describing because I want to see how it sits on the earth. I'm a historian by training. That was my early books were histories. And, I, and I, I pay attention to the genesis of things, people, and place. And therefore, if I'm going to write about Northampton, for example, I need to understand why was it put there. Most of the time it's because of a major river, because that's just the way societies come about. But it's interesting to see, okay, beyond that, what is it doing now? How is it expanding in this way or that way? What does it look like from the sky? That can be extraordinarily informative. Bennington, Vermont, for example, has always considered itself separate from the rest of Vermont. It has a bit of a chip on its shoulder, in fact, because Vermont doesn't pay much attention to Bennington, and Bennington finds little help from Montpelier uh, in times of need. And thus, to its benefit, Bennington has sort of grown inwards and fallen onto its own wits and its own systems uh, to solve its own problems. Uh, it makes it very independent. It makes it very uh, unique in the state. Well, why is that? Why, why this about Bennington and not about uh, Barrington or Burlington or or Brattleboro or other places would begin with a B. So if you go into you know, an airplane and you fly over Bennington, it snaps right into plain view. One crucial reason for this is it doesn't belong in Vermont. You run out of the Green Mountains. You begin to enter the flat, relatively flat rolling plains of New York State, and there's Bennington different kind of mindset, different kind of opposition, different kind of geographical challenge than the rest of Vermont. It simply isn't there. There's a single mountain, Mount Anthony. It's there, but that's it. That's informative. And I wouldn't have come to that realization if I hadn't gotten in an aircraft and overflown the area. So that's just a little example of why I do what I do. I talk to cops, I talk to journalists, I talk to historical societies, I dig around to journalists. I, I find out, or I interview the people who have already done my homework for me. And you don't become obsessive. You don't fill folders and, and manuals and whatnot. Once over lightly, remember, just like Esther Williams underwater, never let them see you sweat. Okay? It's crucial that if you've done some interesting or a lot of research, just reflect the best part and trash the rest. Leave them wanting more. That was my father's advice 
when I left a room, and it probably should be heated now. Thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank you and give you the traditional Bay Path thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much. I will wear it with pride. Lovely. Thank you. So there are books in the back that he has generously donated. You can give 5 to $15 for them that you can get signed. And the money goes to the women's one-day program here at Bay Path, the book fund for women who don't have the extra cash to buy their school books. And then the new book is in the back that you can buy over with Sharon. So hopefully you will all grab some books. He's going to sit down, he'll sign them, and you can enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks.